Hello and welcome to Critical Line Ida. My name is Tom Ravlick. Thank you for joining me for this particular episode of the podcast. One of the things that people looked at over the election campaign incessantly, particularly on social media, is the performance of not just politicians, but also of journalists. Now, it, it, not a lot of folks have got a the longitudinal history or a long perspective or corporate memory even about the way in which the media works. But my guest today has, he's been around a very long time in, in <laughs> journalism, particularly political coverage. And it'll be interesting to hear his insights on, on how journalism has developed and how political coverage has developed and, and how the two of them kind of interact together. Uh, I guess today is Paul Bonjourner, long-term correspondent for the Gen Network, and he also writes columns for the Saturday paper, which you need to read on a regular basis. Paul, thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure, Tom. Hi. Now, it, before we launch into looking at uh, aspects of the media landscape as well as uh, some of your thoughts on where politics has got to, There'll be those who know your name from different things, but they won't necessarily know where you started. Yeah. How would you summarise your career on the back of an envelope for somebody who'd never met you before? OK. Well, I've been a journalist for 48 years. I started, um, you know, full-time journalism back in 1974 on a show called Network 7 Today. And over the next... Uh, 48 years. I, I worked at uh, Seven for about uh, just under a year and the show I was working on um, was closed down and uh, a guy called David Hill, who famously went on to help Kerry Packer launch uh, his version of cricket, etc., was in the newsroom at Seven Melbourne and he'd done a stint at Wollongong, win four, and when our show closed down, he, uh, he said, look, I'll give my mate, uh, the editor at uh, Wollongong, a call to see if he's got a position for you. And they did. They just had uh, a journalist leave and uh, they had an opening. And David Hill said to me, which was very good advice back then, he said, look, you, it'll be great for you to go up to Wollongong because it'll be a real apprenticeship in television journalism for you because I'd come to television journalism in 74, having left the, left the Catholic priesthood uh, as a very uh, young and wet behind the ears uh, Catholic priest. But I had done media work um, uh, you know, for the Catholic Church on radio and television. And um, and I used some of those contacts to get my first job in, in television uh, news in Melbourne. So up to Wollongong I went and for four years uh, I worked in that newsroom. It was a real eye-opener for me because in those days the Federated Iron Workers Association had something like 50,000 members working at the steelworks. I I'd, I'd had my first up personal experience of, you know, of unionism and radical unionism at that time, uh, both in the steelworks and on the wharves at Port Kembla. Uh, and I learned the trade. I learned, uh, I learned how to chase ambulances. I learned how to write scripts. I learned how to put bulletins to air. Uh, and after those four years there, I got a job through contacts uh, in the industry by then at Channel 10 or TVQ0 or TVQO up in Brisbane, the affiliate of the O10 network in those times. And I went up to Brisbane and I was in Brisbane for 10 years. And, and um, they were the last 10 years of Joe Bielke Peterson, the um, premier of Queensland, the premier of probably one of the most corrupt state governments Australia's managed to produce. And while I was up there, I won four Walkley Awards for investigative journalism uh, because our, my news editor, Des McWilliam at uh, TVQ, uh, thought that this would be a way, you know, to, 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 to build ratings. So we did quite serious and very expensive investigative journalism. I can remember the chief executive of, of um, Channel O at the time saying to me, Bonjour, I've just spent two, over $100,000 on legal fees uh, for this story we've just put to air and have been sued for over a million dollars for, and we didn't move the ratings one point. <laughs> so anyway... Um, <laughs> so in at the end of 1987, the um, 10 Network had a vacancy. Uh, in fact, it had a very big vacancy at the um, at its Parliament House Bureau in Canberra. I'd spent the last seven years being the state political editor for Eyewitness News up there, and they asked me would I go down and 
take over this role in, in Canberra? And uh, I said, yes, I would. And down I went. There were a few crossed wires and um, unbeknown to the news director in Sydney, um, Frank Lowy, who owned the network at the time, had managed with a few bucketfuls of money to get Kerry O'Brien <laughs> to come and do the role. So I arrived in Canberra to find out that I was no longer the political editor, but was working with and under Kerry O'Brien, which I must say I welcomed because it gave me a chance to put my feet under the desk, as it were. And that was the beginning in 19, um, late 87, but the beginning of 88 of my long and continuing period in the parliamentary press gallery. I retired full time from 10, five years ago. I still have a relationship with the network. Uh, but since then, I have become, as I joke when I talk to the odd um, <laughs> the liberal um, MP, I say I'm one of your constituents now. I'm a small business person, Paul Bongiorno Incorporated. And uh, I have a regular column every Every week for the Saturday paper and a regular podcast with them uh, with Schwartz Media called 7am and I also have a weekly column with an online news site called The New Daily which when um, Bruce Guthrie uh, approached me four years ago to, to write a column for it I hadn't heard of it uh, it's funded by the big union super funds and it's a very serious online 24-7 news operation it has 1.7 million subscribers uh, and, and is um, doing great work. Uh, so that sort of, all of that keeps me um, pretty busy. And um, so now I, well, I don't say I've retired, I've, I've repositioned. And of course, one of the problems when I was at the head of the news bureau, basically you work 24 seven, because while I was there for almost um, 15 years, I was the uh, your presenter and uh, executive producer of the Sunday morning um, uh, political program called Meet the Press. So between doing that and my <laughs> daily news job, I was basically working seven days a week, whereas now I only work three days a week, but keep my eye on everything for the <laughs> for the other four. Now, let me, let's get back to the way this conversation began, because you got, you, you mentioned the your movement from the, the the priesthood into journalism, yeah, um, and it's an interesting transition. Hmm. The reason I uh, the reason it's interesting to me is you know, how does that how had did has that background in, um, uh, contributed to the way in which you view the uh, the world you report. Yeah. Well, look, I have to say to you that, you know, without, you know, being too um, theological, <laughs> theologically airy-fairy about it, but I uh, I studied uh, for the Catholic priesthood in uh, under the Jesuits in Melbourne for four years, and then I went and finished my studies in Rome uh, in 1966, and that was the immediate year after the Second Vatican Council, when uh, the Roman Catholic Church had a good hard look at itself and opened, as it were, the windows uh, to, to, to the contemporary um, winds, if you like. Uh, and the professors that taught me at the P Pontifical University I was at, the Urban University, um, several of them were Pariti or experts to the council. And the guy that taught me systematic theology had had a worldview, which in a way suited me very well for, uh, for going into journalism, because his basic worldview is there aren't two worlds. There's not the supernatural and the natural. There's only the real world. And, and in the real world, you seek truth, and truth has a capital T on it, and truth is, is of a piece. So wherever you find truth, you're looking for ultimate reality, you know. Uh, I don't want to go any further into that, but it's quite interesting. This theologian was quite uh, uh, influenced, as was Vatican II, by the work of the great uh, um, Jesuit uh, Teilhard de Chardin, who had an evolutionary view of theology. He was a paleontologist himself, and, and that shaped, as it were, his theology and his ontology. So, so I'd already been doing work for the Catholic Church in the media and found it quite attractive. And I, and I thought, well, look, uh, I've got to eat. <laughs> 
I've got to get a job somewhere. And having just completed eight years of, of um, you know, tertiary study, including a master's degree in theology in Rome, uh, I didn't think I could, you know, put it on my old man to help me out anymore if I went off and did a law degree or whatever. So I thought I'd better earn a living. And um, I thought maybe going into television news, given that I'd done, uh, you know, a fair bit of work in that area for the church, might be a good start. And um, John Stapp, the manager of Channel 6 in Ballarat, where I was working, ran his good mate, Ron Casey, at Channel 7 in Melbourne, said, I've got this likely cult. Have you got anything where you can fit him in? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, we have a vacancy for Network 7 today, <laughs> uh, which is a morning show. Um, and, um, you know, how do you like to be the Melbourne end of that? And I thought, I'd love it. Thank you very much. So that's, uh, you know, that's that's where uh, the cross section was. And I'd have to mm -hmm. say to you that journalism is basically in the service of, and the, the service and the search for truth, you know, which, which then goes down to broader issues, which, of course, I was steeped in through my, um, you know, Catholic uh, upbringing and certainly my studies both in Melbourne and in Rome uh, on Catholic social justice. And that naturally blows into looking at a range of issues which you, which you would touch on. Yes. Now, truth with a capital T, Paul, yeah. um, is an interesting concept mm. <laughs> in the world that we exist in now. Yeah. Um, you started in journalism back in the 70s. Um, 1974, Gough Whitlam is still the Prime Minister. Yeah, and to interview people like Frank Crean, his treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> but when we, um, and it, it, this is probably a good way to segue into the media question. Yep. To what extent do you think the search for actual truth has been cast aside for, for want of a better word, for entertainment? Hmm. That's a very complex question, Tom. And uh, it, 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 I can, it, there's a, there's a multi-dimensional way of looking at it, as there is, of course, on all things. First of all, um, journalism is about communication of the truth you find or you're reporting. That's the first thing. But we live in a commercial world, and my whole career in journalism has been in, in the commercial world, uh, commercial television, and now uh, writing for the New Daily and, and the uh, Saturday paper. They need advertisers to, to keep them going and to attract advertisers. They need an audience, and to attract an audience, they've got to present stuff in a way that excites people's interest. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, the great, um, what would you call him, philosopher of communication, uh, you know, the medium is the message. Mm -hmm. he, he wrote once that uh, people are best informed or educated when they're entertained. And he likened the stained glass windows of the medieval uh, cathedrals as ways of communicating in those days the biblical stories, the stories of the Christian faith, because the people would come in and, uh, you know, the people in the Middle Ages that would come in, they were basically illiterate and would marvel at the play of light through the stone, stained glass windows, teaching them something about their religion, for example. But that same principle applies today. And for example, if Charles Dickens wrote boring books, he'd never be one of the greatest writers in the English language, or Shakespeare more sublimely. Um, so from that point of view, you do need you do need journalism that is lively and that communicates and that therefore can be monetized. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't think we should look down our noses at any of that. But then it comes to what you're getting at is the truth. Now, there has without a doubt been an evolution in the way in which the media works, and we can perhaps go into this in more detail. But media proprietors have to look for business models, business cases. And it does seem, for example, with the Murdochs, particularly with Fox 
News in America, but even with their tabloids here in Australia, that they've found that there is a commercial niche appealing to people's fears and prejudices in a, in a specific sort of way, whereas the old, broader journalism, uh, while it still had to be entertaining and, and uh, gee whiz in many ways, um, didn't have that same business model. And that, that leads to the other, uh, another uh, criticism of the media that's been made, and that is a lot has been said by some commentators. I think the column by Sean Kelly recently for yeah. SMH and, and The Age spoke about the investment in opinion, yeah. which anybody can have. I mean, it, any, anyone's capable of having an opinion. Yeah. Um, it doesn't it's necessarily have to be but factual. You're entitled to your opinions, but not your own facts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, precisely. That it uh, you can have an opinion, but that doesn't mean that it's grounded in what uh, my auditing students were taught when I was in front of the classroom, which is in order to have an opinion mm. on a set of numbers, you need to have sufficient, appropriate audit evidence. Exactly. You know, where is the evidentiary basis for what you are saying? Yeah. Um, and from time to time, I listen to and read what we get, and I often ask myself the question, where is the evidence for what is being said? Yeah. Or how is that evidence being framed? Is that a similar thing that goes through your mind? Well, Absolutely. Uh, you might remember the great um, Peter Bowers, the longtime um, journalist with Fairfax, the Sydney Morning Herald in uh, in Sydney. He was a, a longtime political correspondent based in Canberra. And <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> interestingly, when he retired, I can remember having a drink with him in the courtyard at Parliament House. And um, you can beep this out if you need to. But he said, he said to me, Bonjourno, you know, the best thing about me retiring? I said, no, well, what's that, Peter? He says, I don't have to talk to a fucking politician again. <laughs> thought, That's very interesting. But having, but having said that, Bowers had a terrific insight into what you're talking about. Bowers said any column, any opinion piece that's worth its salt has to, first of all, um, value add to the story that it is up you know, analysing, value add, add something new and newsworthy to it and delve deeper into the truth of the situation. So in other words, if you're going to be a true journalistic analyst, you have to apply the, the principles and the criteria of the Australian Journalists Association, you know, the values of fair fairness, uh, accuracy, uh, um, while showing no fear or favour. So whether you're writing an opinion piece or reporting a news piece, these values, if they're to be worth their salt, must be applied. Now, it is true that, you know, what one, one person's... Uh, uh, what one person's truth can be another person's spin, and there is no doubt there are many ways of looking at, at realities, you know, and, 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 and analysing them, but that's fine. Uh, people are entitled to different opinions as long as what they're opinionating, opinionating on, you know, um, has a departure point in, in the reality, you know. Um, uh, and, and I think that this is one of the greatest things about our democracy or democracy in general, that all ideas can be contested. And, and um, you know, we, we can't get away from that. It's when people seem to live in parallel universes, pandering exclusively to the prejudices and fears of a rather narrow worldview that we get what we're living with now, and that is fake news versus reality, which is extremely disturbing. To what extent do you think the players in the political class contribute to, to the observation you've just made? Well, look, uh, they contribute in a big way because what they're doing, especially our major political players, they spend fortunes on 
market research. They see themselves as commodities. They see themselves as how can we sell something and how do we best sell it better than our competitor? And if you can press certain buttons in a certain context to do better, to, to attract support, well, then you'll do it. And the, the big question now is from what departure point? And I still do think that the departure point in politics generally, but let's just talk about Australian politics, is still conservative versus liberal. And when I say the word liberal, I use it in the true meaning of the word. You know, okay. So I'm not talking about the Liberal Party. I'm talking about liberalism. Uh, liberalism, which is open to change, which is open to other opinions, which is open to respect for difference. And conservatism, which tends to say what we have is the best way unless you can prove otherwise. And what we have is serving me and, 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 and my type and our society much better than these other people that are about mm -hmm. experimentation and challenging everything. You know, so in a sense, that's the way our politics breaks down in the broad. You know, we call it left or right, conservative, progressive, conservative, liberal, you know. Now, people tend to be conservatives by uh, drother, you know, by by their uh, bent, if you like. And other people tend to be liberals by their bent, you know. Um, the thing that most disturbs me is that that if you whether you're a liberal or a conservative if you close yourself off to being challenged to new facts to new realities then then we've got real trouble you know but then the next point is that if you're only in there for power's sake to serve your own interests and therefore to manipulate um, new facts new fears and all the rest of it for your own purposes and not to serve truth and not to serve a better way, not to serve a more just society, then we are diminished as a society, you know. And uh, like it's fascinating, for example, the huge development I've seen in my 40 years of journalism. When I first started in journalism, there was no such thing as domestic violence. You know, it existed, but it wasn't a crime. It was just a domestic either. That's just a, there was no such crime as rape in marriage. Now, over those 40 years, the, uh, the sensibilities of our society have changed enormously. And then again, in terms of sexuality. Um, when I started in journalism, in every state of Australia, male homosexuality was uh, illegal. If you practiced it, you know, you could be you could be homosexual as long as you didn't practice it, because if you practiced it, you were then illegal. You're committing a crime. Interestingly, female homosexuality wasn't because the lawmakers didn't believe women could possibly be what we would call lesbians or homosexual. But look at the enormous understanding and development now as we understand, thanks to new truth and insight into psychosexual development, that, for example, your your um, sexual preference is the wrong way to describe it. It's your sexual identity. It's not what you've preferred to be. It's what you've discovered yourself to be. And then if you then believe in the dignity of all human beings as the basis for a free society, you will respect that difference. You will respect the gay person. You'll respect the person who perhaps is struggling with their sexual identity and gender. You will understand why people prefer they rather than he or she. Now, what I've just said to you now would is would be considered in some circles as extreme liberalism that has that has shut the, the door to to the um, absolute truth as found, for example, in a narrow interpretation of the Bible. You know what I'm saying to you? Yep. Uh, you know, uh, but 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 the fact is, what I've just said to you, I would submit based on, for example, the uh, success of the same-sex marriage uh, plebiscite, is basically the zeitgeist of contemporary Australia. Which is it, interesting that you should say that because we're entering into a broader discourse now, looking at the constitutional recognition mm. for you know, First Nations peoples, yeah. you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And that debate in its own right is starting to uh, simmer. Yes. It hasn't got to boil yet. No. 
but it's beginning with it's beginning to simmer and we can start to see some of the um some of the divisions that are going to uh, ampli get amplified yes as we get closer to the referendum how are you observing those initial movements as a as someone who's seen referenda succeed yep. and fail before right well first of all we can't get away from the broader political context. The referendum is being proposed by a Labour Prime Minister and the Liberal opposition, his you know, political competitor, has adopted a wait and see attitude along the lines, I am convinced, as an innocent bystander, <laughs> <laughs> looking for is it in our interests to go with this or is it in our interest to go against it now if you can believe all the opinion polls at this point of time it would clearly be in peter dutton the leader of the opposition's interest to go with it a poll mm -hmm. the australian australia institute put out last week showed that 65 percent of all australians support yes for uh, the voice and 56% of Liberal voters say they were asked, would you vote yes? And they said, I would vote yes. So that seems to be the starting point. But as you say, before, before the naysayers get really busy. Now, um, uh, so the disturbing thing about all of that is as we saw in the 1999 Republic referendum, people can drag all sorts of dead cats across the table. People can confuse, people can play on fears, people can play on prejudices with a wink and a nudge. And, uh, you know, I agree with you, we're beginning to see some of that. For example, it's already been descri described as racially divisive. And we've even got some Aboriginal people on the right claiming that, you know, whereas, Basically, we're not talking race. We're talking there were a people here in Australia long before our, our ancestors arrived on the First Fleet who, who had, if you like, prior possession and ownership and were dispossessed in a cruel and bloody way. And what we are doing is we want to recognise this foundational injustice and address it as best we might. Now, whether these people were black, white, brindle or yellow, they were people and they were here and their, and their descendants are still here as well. So, so what we're asking for here is, as it were, uh, um, value adding to our nation, really, as a nation of, of, of justice and equality. And, and, and we're asking people to come along uh, in, in, in that enterprise. Now, we're also saying, yes, these people have a special place given their historic uh, ancestry uh, and, and they are still, you know, given the fact uh, of what's going on in Aboriginal communities, particularly in Western Australia, Northern Territory and remote parts of uh, Queensland, but even, even down in uh, parts of New South Wales, um, there are real issues here that need to be addressed and they're saying we want to have an input into the way in which our governments address it. And I can't see how that in any way threatens me as, a, as an Australian of European heritage. The interesting thing is in how do we, how do we report the differences of opinion within the First Nations communities? Now, you... It might be a bizarre question for you and I to discuss, given our yeah, European background. Yeah. Um, uh, but how do you report that without um, without doing it in a fundamentalist way? Because there are, in terms of adopting a view one way or another in in in, in reportage or in slanting the story, because there seems to be a genuine belief, for example, on the part of someone like Warren Mundine, yes, that having a voice is another possibility, is another uh, avenue for conversation, but it doesn't mean that 
the things that uh, he believes should be done in the Indigenous communities to be able to, for them to, to prosper will necessarily work. Now, it will necessarily, you know, happen as a result of that conversation they're happening now. So why go down that road? Whereas mm. you've got other people like Megan Davis and Marshall Langton and, mm. and a range of others um, who said, well, this is this is a necessary way forward so we are heard on matters that impact directly on us, uh, that may impact on us as a general rule because of legislation passing and mm. anything else that... Uh, May arise that, that you know merits a conversation. Hmm. And how do we report that, Paul? It, it, without well, 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 I think we report it in, in in various ways. I mean, um, at, at one level, you know, in a five minute radio news bulletin, if, if, if you know, look for argument's sake, Mond Mundine comes out and says something, well, you can say, well, uh, but you know. Uh, you know, Marcia Langton said this today, but Warren Ming Mundine, you know, um, d disagrees and says that. The difficulty then comes down when when you are assessing what L Langton says or what Mundine says, mm -hmm. when you come to write analysis or speak analysis or appear on the drum or, or write for the Saturday paper on the issue. And, and, and as we saw in recent times, when Peter Fitzsimons for the Sun Herald in Sydney interviewed Jacinta Price, the Aboriginal senator from the Northern Territory. And uh, I read that piece and I was quite fascinated by it because I, I, I saw, for example, uh, there was a there was some dissonance in her views. And also I saw that she was struggling in one sense. She was the way in which she resolved her own identity crisis and belonging was in one way to to uh, was in a real way for her to to opt for her price side rather than her Aboriginal side and, and say that, that where we are today and Aborigines should get this is as a result of the great benefits that Europeans brought. You know, well, the point about this is that you don't need to have your European side and your Aboriginal side against each other to have the sort of recognition that the voice is seeking. Um, the other thing that, that, that annoys me beyond belief, and I notice whenever I dare to go anywhere near it on Twitter, for example, you know, um, someone who I would describe as racist, I don't know who the hell they are, they had some sort of handle which didn't amount to anything, but they said, you know, after 60,000 years, what did the Aborigines give us? And he put up a didgeridoo and, and, um, and sticks, you know, uh, compared to a symphony orchestra. Well, look, we're not here evaluating what the 60,000 year culture has or has not done, you know, where what we're evaluating is the dignity of the human beings that belong to that culture. Now, all culture needs, and uh, we've discussed this already, for example, in the attitudes to sexuality and even sexual crime, it, it evolves. All living culture has to be has to change and grow. Otherwise, uh, uh, otherwise, you're going for a perverse reactionary uh, uh, position that that uh, leads to pain and di diminishment. Really, um, so 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 for a start, right there, we've got one of the difficulties. And how the hell do we make that distinction that I've just made to you? We're not we're not asking you to evaluate whether whether Aborigines were primitive or not. We're, you know, in our terms, in cultural terms, we're asking you to evaluate were they human beings with rights? And by the way, you know, once you once you accept that, well, you can actually go to, and, and this is the other side of it, you can actually go to these human beings, in fact, had a quite developed and sophisticated spiritual understanding of themselves and their world. And, and, and in fact, their understanding of country, I would argue very strongly, parallels the sort of insight we got uh, in the Bible, particularly with the experience of the early you know, Jewish communities and when I say early, I'm going back thousands of years in their mm -hmm. understanding of creation, where God made us from the clay of the earth. 
I mean, there is a there's an amazing uh, a confluence right there, you know, and that's what I was talking about before about capital T truth, you know, um, and and that of course when, when, once you see things in those sorts of maybe anthropological or theological terms, um, you know, you you can see um, you, you you can see why the voice uh, can achieve so much in recognizing a real dignity as human beings that uh, First Nations people have. We've acknowledged that there's a, a way in which things um, are narrated or stories are told. Yeah. Sometimes it's done to you know, get more eyeballs and get mm. ads and get people upset. Does that make it tougher? Given the climate and also social media and other other things, to actually focus on this particular element of that discourse, which is a voice and parliamentary representation, which people argue is increased in mm -hmm. terms of the First Nations yeah. peoples, that the voice and the parliamentary representation can actually coexist. When you say parliamentary rep representation, you're talking about First Nations people that are actually being elected. elected. So you've got the 10 or 11 in, par yeah, in federal yeah. parliament yeah. and the argument being that's the way in which you get a voice, that is, you get yeah. elected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's yeah. a perverse... Well, 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 there's two points to be made there. First of all, those who are elected to represent the broader community as Labor or Liberal or Green... Uh, are elected to represent that broad community. You know, uh, they can bring obviously their Aboriginality to it, and they can have interests in in um, uh, in the issues uh, uh, relating to First Nations people. And indeed, for example, the Prime Minister has made a First Nation person uh, a cabinet minister with uh, Linda Burney with charge of um, Indigenous Australians. Uh, the Greens have done the same with uh, Lydia Thorpe. Um, unfortunately, for the Liberals, their most senior uh, Aboriginal representative Ken Wyatt lost his seat and Jacinta Price is too junior to go straight into shadow cabinet. So, um, you know, they're at a bit of a disadvantage from that point of view. Um, but having said all of that, let's be absolutely crystal clear that the voice to parliament is an institutionalised advisory vehicle. Mm -hmm. And it was pointed out by a... Um, constitutional lawyer in a discussion I saw the other day, that in the Constitution of Australia, there's a thing called the Interstate Commission, which doesn't exist. There's provision for it, but it doesn't exist. It hasn't been acted, if you like. So what Albanese said up at Gama was, we want you to accept the principle of the voice. And if you have a Labor government, the voice could look like this. But if you then have a liberal government, they may amend that and do it in a different way. You know, so mm -hmm. people who I suspect are there for political purposes to sink the whole thing, mainly to embarrass them, Albanese, uh, we say, well, we want the we we want the details. Well, in one sense, the detail is: do you accept the principle that First Nations people have dignity that we should recognise? They were dispossessed by us. And secondly, do you accept the principle that, given that they are a recognisable reality today, especially in remoter parts of Australia, that they should have a say or, or uh, an advisory say in how they are dealt with? Uh, which, of course, um, uh, the Parliament of Australia and the Government of Australia can listen to and accept or reject, which, by the way, governments of Australia have been doing since Federation. And as we're finding out in contemporary times, royal commissions set up to advise have been making all sorts of recommendations, uh, you know, which governments have ignored or only half fulfilled. So you can see the two stages here. How do we make that point? How do we say to people, you know, does is there a fairness genie in the bottle that we can let out that you will recognize you know or 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 or, or are other distractions and and uh, fake arguments going to be put up for all sorts of demeaning reasons well we've covered a lot of ground and uh, you've been generous with your time uh, so there's probably just a couple more uh, 
questions that are, I guess, pertinent. Um, one of the things that I observe as, you, as someone who's watched your program <laughs> over the years, you know, meet yeah. the press on, on the 10 network, yeah. and then other programs over time, is that uh, there seems to be less of a um, focus on in-depth, you know, interviews. A bit like, I, I, I use the example of BBC Hard Talk, yep. <laughs> which is a half-hour program, and there's an intensity to that conversation mm. every time, you know, by the way, just remind me, I've, I've heard Hard Talk. Is that TV as well as radio, or is it just radio? Uh, it's TV. Right, yeah. It's hey, TV I, on the BBC. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I've heard it on radio. I've never seen it, I don't think. Mm. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I've certainly seen it on the on BBC World. It's a fascinating half hour. Yeah. How have you observed the sort of evolution of that kind of political interview interview program um, programs that we've seen yes well that's a very interesting question it's interesting that the bbc has hard talk uh because the the bbc is despite what the conservatives want to do <laughs> in britain uh has the great benefit of being funded extremely generously by broadcast licenses Whereas the ABC in Australia, the Whitlam government back in 72, 73, got rid of broadcast licences and the ABC in Australia is funded grace in favour of the government of the day. Uh, but having said that, that, you know, they do have a 24 news channel on television and a 24 hour radio channel, as well as, of course, doing news bulletins and current affairs on, on, on their various radio um, networks. Um, I would say to you, Tom, that even something like hard talk uh, has a restricted audience. I can be a bit uppity here and say to you a restricted elite audience. So the judgment might be made by broadcasters, either the ABC and commercial broadcasters here in Australia, that 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 uh, appealing to that sort of elite audience, um, you know, it isn't going to do much for us in terms of monetizing or, or purveying influence. Because don't forget that the ABC and the commercial TV networks are not only into, well, not the ABC, but the commercial TV aren't only into making network, they are also about purveying influence. And I can tell you, because I was there at the very time when Gary Rice, who was the uh, uh, CEO of the 10 network coming out of receivership, decided that, that to uh, have more weight with the federal government of the day, we needed to do a serious political program to put the politicians on notice that we exist, we're doing serious stuff, and that you should take more notice of us. That was, that was as much a part of the original um, reason behind Meet the Press uh, as anything else. Um, and in fact, over the 20 years that I had to do with the program, at various times, newer CEOs and boards thought that it'd be a good idea to get rid of it. Now, I'm talking before social media and 24-hour news and all the rest of it. And uh, I was able to remind the board and to remind the CEO that to meet the press play, it's niche, it's worthy, but it plays an extremely important role in showing the government and the federal politicians of the day that we're a serious um, vehicle and we should be taken seriously so that when we come to make submissions about um, you know, legislation or regulation in regard to broadcasting and all the rest of it, you mightn't want to be so quick to make us very, very unhappy. You know, this is <laughs> so. So that that that's um, you know. So so that's a bit of a reality check there. And you might remember that Meet the Press at the time was up against um, the excellent current affairs show that Channel Nine had for years called Sunday. And one of the key elements of the Sunday program was the Laurie Oaks political interview. Mm -hmm. And for years, it was 
uh, Oaks on nine and uh, Meet the Press on 10 for most of its life with me uh, as the host, um, you know, fighting every week to get, you know, the, the, the key interviews. And it was as a result of the sort of influence and the sort of um, uh, standing that Meet the Press and Sunday had that the ABC thought, shit, we better get on board. And then Barry Cassidy, who, by the way, uh, was came back being a house husband in Washington to Heather Hewitt, who was the ABC's care, um, uh, Washington correspondent. He came back, he got a job in the 10 Bureau um, with me. Uh, and he spent his last, he spent his two years at 10 being the host of Meet the Press. I took over from him as host. And then when he went, uh, when Heather went to Melbourne, he went down, um, um, left 10, went to Melbourne, and he sold the idea of um, of uh, insiders to the That's ABC, right. yeah. making the sort of arguments I've just made to you. The interesting thing with 10 now, I actually miss that format. Um, in, in the context of having journalists also ask questions of the politician, Paul. Yeah. Um, it doesn't happen no. in, in other formats, whether it be insiders, whether it be um, the uh, well, agenda on Sky, maybe, or uh, or even 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 what news uh, you know, news twenty four, you know, the the TV news channel of the ABC uh, generally has one on one interviews, doesn't have panel interviews. Yeah, yeah, it's it's something that you know, when you talk to, I've spoken to people about that, and they said, oh, but it cuts the flow of the interview. Well, no, but Bonjourno did it for years, and it didn't seem to. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, well, that comes down. I mean, we gained experience over the years, and what happens is that you sit down with the panel in the green room, and you basically plan out, and um, you know where you're going to go with the, with the interview, and 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 you make the point that if someone's on a roll, you let them stay on that role, you know, uh, and and we mainly achieved that. Occasionally, you'd be frustrated when someone else jumped in, but uh, but oh, that added to the frisson. <laughs> yeah. What just finally, um, Paul, the big one of the biggest uh, issues that I often get asked about. It, it's not, I mean, it's not world sh uh, chattering, but occasionally people ask me how, what I read or what I do to stay up to date. Mm. And my advice to people is, wherever possible, don't boycott an organisation. Be selective mm. with what you read and what you watch. Because by boycotting something, for example, there are people who won't watch Sky in a fit, hmm. even if they could listen to it for free on iHeartRadio, which you can, hmm. because it's a Murdoch organisation. Hmm. What's your advice as a final wrap-up, uh, to wrap this conversation up, uh, to people who are looking to, to better understand the world they're in from a political standpoint? <clears throat> Yeah, well, that that's a very interesting question, uh, and it is true that you know the more input you get, the more uh, the more you're able to evaluate, the better position you're being to evaluate. But I can tell you now that I've um, you know no longer have my media paid for by my employer. I mean, when I was the bureau chief at ten, uh, we were spending three hundred dollars a month for me to get every newspaper in Australia. You know, well, people can't afford that, and now, for example, uh, I do. Uh, subscribe to Foxtel, even uh, mainly to get access to to Sky, uh, and, and and by subscribing subscribing to Foxtel, I also get access to um, CNN and BBC World as well as Fox News in America. Well, of course, these days, uh, and there was a report yesterday on this. Uh, you don't have to subscribe to Foxtel anymore to get all of, uh, access to all of those because they're all, you know, streaming, and the streaming services tend to be cheaper than than Foxtel. Yeah, they've got it on. They've got it all on Flash now. Which yeah, I that's think is eight, eight or ten dollars a month. Yeah, that's right. So it's cheaper and more accessible. But but look, 
generally, uh, like for example, in my own habits, I I, I pay for the um, uh, the Canberra Times, the Sydney Morning Herald, and and the Australian, and um, and I watch, for example, Sunday Agenda, which I think is excellent, and I watch Afternoon News Agenda on Sky, which I also think is excellent. Excellent. I honestly, at times, dip in and out of Sky After Dark, and I uh, they're not serious. Uh, they're coming from a very skewed agenda and they add nothing except bile. So I wouldn't go there if you want, you know, real information. Uh, and, and of course, I do um, watch um, and listen to the ABC. So um, and, and because I'm a working journalist still, I'm on the uh, I'm on the mail out lists for the prime minister, the leader of the opposition, all the ministers and the shadow ministers. So even if I miss interviews that, for example, Peter Dutton might have done on 2GB or, or Albanese on 2GB, uh, which, of course, you can access online these days, uh, I, I get the transcripts. But then again, if you want to catch up, uh, all of these senior politicians, all of these politicians, have websites that are free to access and they all put their transcripts up on them, you know. And in fact, uh, the Prime Minister, leader of the opposition and, uh, and, and, and most of the politicians have Facebook pages where they actually post their interviews. So you can actually go and watch them free of charge if, if that's your druthers. But, but in other words, uh, you know, it's up to you how well you want to be informed. And in principle, I agree with you. I mean, I actually agree that that if you're going to be well informed, you need to know the arguments being mounted by all sides, including, for example, Mundine and Jacinda Price, including Peter Peter Dutton and all the rest of it, um, so that you you know you, you know the lay of the land, you know. Especially if you're going to vote on something like a federal election or a referendum. Yeah, well, that's right. By the way, I did notice that in the latest uh, analysis of the uh, federal election, something like 60% of people st still said that they got all the, most of their information on federal politics from watching commercial television news. So despite the fact that we now have social media and many other platforms, that was an interesting uh, finding. And of course, the other thing to say to you is all the commercial television networks, like the ABC, are these days multi-platform anyway. Paul, uh, you just said earlier, you've been generous with your time this afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your experience and your your perspective on how you know, journalism and politics kind of mesh together. <laughs> and and then hopefully uh, there'll be some there'll be folks who listen to it that that start to broaden their horizons as well. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, thanks for putting up with me for a whole hour. <laughs> okay. Sure. Thanks. <laughs>